I'm Beth Keller, and I'd like to welcome you this evening to Library in Your Living Room, our series of virtual programs. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We're very excited to welcome tonight Rachel Beanland as part of the library's ongoing Meet the Author series. She's joining us tonight to discuss her new book, Florence Adler Swims Forever. Rachel writes fiction and essays. Florence Adler Swims Forever is her first novel, which was just published in July. Congratulations on that, Rachel. Um, says the New York Times about the book, Beanland's novel draws the reader in. Rachel's joining us tonight from her home in Richmond, Virginia. Rachel will be joined by noted book discussion leader, Judy Levin, for an in-conversation event. Judy leads book discussions for the library and with 30 book groups throughout the area. Before I turn it over to Rachel and Judy, please note that as an attendee tonight, your microphones and camera are turned off. We'll conclude the program with questions and answers, and those can, your questions can be entered into the chat box. The chat box is turned off now, but we'll turn it on towards the end of the event so you can type your questions in there. Before I turn it over to Rachel and Judy, I would like to introduce Allie Gilly from the book bin in Northbrook. Signed copies of Florence Adler Swims Forever can be purchased from the book bin and mailed to your home, picked up from the book bin in Northbrook, or even picked up from the library on Friday afternoon. When ordering, you can just indicate pick up at HP Library, and the book bin's contact information is on the screen now. So I'd like to turn it over to Allie. Hi everyone, thank you so much for supporting tonight's event and supporting authors and indie bookstores and of course libraries. Uh, we all work together to make a, a rich and, um, and a varied community of readers and all our voices, um, you know, blend together to make the important uh, symphony that we all are together. Uh, I would love if you would uh, purchase a book from um, the book bin. We have some signed book plates that Rachel uh, graciously signed and sent to the store so that when you purchase a book, you can uh, be certain that it will have this special uh, book plate in it. And uh, we just hope that all of you are thinking about small businesses right now, and uh, we certainly need you. So I am really excited for tonight's event and um, appreciate you all coming and supporting the book bin. Allie, thanks so much for joining us and um, for being our bookseller this evening. So I'm going to now turn it over to Rachel and Judy to start our conversation about Florence Adler Swims Forever. Thank you, Beth. And thanks to the Highland Park Library for hosting this conversation. I think everybody's in for a real treat. Um, certainly some of you sitting out there in your homes have read the book already, but probably many of you haven't. We're going to try and be careful not to do any spoilers along the way. Um, and maybe we'll have a chance to do a little extra talking towards the end. We'll see how it all goes. Anyways, so Florence Adler swims for Ever. And here's the book. We got to see the yeah. close up. There we go. I wish I had a book stand to do it right there, but it's a really nice cover. In fact, when I got dressed, I thought, dare I wear a bathing suit and a bathing cap on screen tonight? I decided not, tempting, but anyway, but no. <laughs> tempting. So there it is. Florence Adler swims forever. It's a, be it's a beautiful cover. It is. It's Re a really cover. a nice cover. Um, so Florence Adler swims forever arrived in July with a publishing splash. The book was a Barnes and Noble book club pick. It was featured title on bookreporter.com, which some of you probably follow. Uh, Rachel also was hosted via a Zoom discussion, something like this, through the Jewish Book Council, which is where I was first introduced to the book. They have a program called Authors at the Table, and it was a very nice program. And she's done so many more since then, these kinds of interviews and conversations, sharing her book and the story with all of us out here who are always looking for the next book that we want to read. It's a very impressive debut novel, I have to tell you that, Rachel, and very impressive coverage that you've gotten, and Simon & Schuster did a wonderful job as the publisher really promoting it, so they get some good credits too. 
So we're going to hear from Rachel about her inspiration, her writing style, her research, and more, and start thinking of your questions. Um, jot them down on a little piece of paper next to you, because you heard Beth say that there will be an opportunity for Q&A, and that will be on the chat box. And hopefully everybody on Zoom knows where to find your chat box. Right now, nobody can um, you know, write on it, but if you put your cursor down and get those icons, you'll see chat. And if you click on that, a box opens. And then you can just type right in there what you want to ask. And Beth will be looking at those questions towards the end of the program. So what is it about if you haven't read it yet? Florence Adler, the title character, is a college student, a young woman from a Jewish family, and she's also a champion swimmer. The book is set in 1934. She tragically drowns off the beach of Atlantic City while training to swim the English Channel. The rest of the story, and that happens chapter one, so I, there's no spoiler alerts there. That's within the first few pages. The rest, the rest of the story follows seven people deeply affected by Florence's death. And then following that, the decision made to keep her death a secret from her older sister, Fanny, who is in the hospital on bed rest, awaiting the birth of her child. The story flows from there, alternating chapters with different viewpoints, different narratives, introducing us to these seven other individuals. And we learn about them, we learn about Florence a little more, and we learn all their stories and all their secrets. So I wanna start out by asking Rachel to share her inspiration for this, since this is your debut novel. Why this one? Yeah. Well, um, if, if you have read the book, there is an author's note at the end. I would warn you, do not read the author's note before you've read the book, because it will give things away. Um, but the, the novel is based on a true story that took place in my family um about 90 years ago uh i had a great great aunt named florence lowenthal and she was training to swim the english channel when she drowned off the coast of atlantic city uh, my whole family was this is on my mother's side of the family was from atlantic city they had lived there for a couple of generations and um when she died my grandmother was a little girl on the beach um, and her mother florence's sister was in the hospital on bed rest um, she had lost a baby the summer before, and the family did make the decision not to tell her that her sister had died. Um, the story was always told to me, you know, as I was growing up, I mean, it was a story that, as you can imagine, lasted throughout the generations. Um, and when I was coming along in the 80s and 90s, it was primarily my mother who would tell me the story. Um, and by then the emphasis had really shifted from, uh, you know, while it was tragic that of course that Florence had drowned, she had at that point died 60 years ago or so. Um, what, what really became the focus of the story was what a strong woman Esther must have been. And I'm, I'm gonna use their fictional names throughout tonight just to make things simple. Um, but what a strong woman Esther must have been to walk into that hospital room and act as if everything was fine. Um, and I can remember, even as a small child and certainly as a teenager and a young adult, uh, really questioning that decision. Um, you know, my mother was very certain that uh, that was the right call, you know, that Esther had made the right call. And I, um, I always just wondered about it. I thought, well, gosh, if I if I were Fanny in the hospital bed, um, I'd maybe want to know. Um, you know, it was a it's a big secret to keep. And um, the as I started to think about writing a novel and and you know, fictionalizing this story, it it jumped out at me as as being a story that would would be wonderful to fictionalize because of the fact that there wasn't a clear answer. Um, my mother was convinced Esther had done the right thing. When I was younger, I was convinced that she shouldn't have kept the secret. Um, and the fact that we kind of couldn't meet in the middle told me that, um, that there was something there. And so by my mid-30s, I was 
you know, really getting serious about writing a novel and, and was, and, and this was the natural novel that I wanted to write. Um, so I started it in the fall of 2016 uh, and finished it in the fall of 2018. And, and then it sold in the winter of 2019. So. Did you ever think of writing it more as a memoir rather than fictionalizing it? You know, um, I am attracted to writing creative nonfiction. Um, and I certainly have written a lot of essays and, and things like that. Um, but I was never tempted to write this as nonfiction because there was so much I didn't know. Um, and the main thing that I didn't know was I didn't know all of their feelings. You know, like I, I really was going to ha have to take a, a wild guess on all of the emotionality behind the secret. Um, I knew the very bare bones of, of what had happened that summer. And I was able to do a decent amount of research over the course of, you know, writing the novel. So I, I uncovered a little bit more. I talked to my grandmother um, while she was still alive. I visited archives. I, you know, I got a few other other things, um, but, you know, it was enough to write an essay maybe, but not a not a book. And and at that time also, I was very interested in writing fiction. So I just don't think that a, a piece of nonfiction would have held my attention at, at that point. Okay. Can you talk at all about your inspirations of um, from the MFA program that you went to? How, how did that help in developing this as a book? Since it was your first one um, yeah. to, to come out with this story rather than, uh, you know, there, there's the always thing, well, like the, the write what you know, you're the first novel that you come out with. Very often authors are asked, is it just kind of a slimly autobiographical yeah. kind of story and how was your time at your MFA program affecting what you wanted to write because it seems like this story was in you from the time you were a little girl yeah I think you know when you when you talk about the the MFA um rule of thumb the, you know, the writing what you know um in some ways I was writing what I knew because because it was a story that I had kind of held on to for many years and um and always it had always intrigued me and I'd always asked questions about it. Um, I, I kind of came to the MFA program a little bit backwards. So I, I would not recommend that others maybe follow in my exact uh, footsteps. But partly, you know, I graduated from college um, in 2003 and I had not studied creative writing. I had always been a reader and a writer, but I, I just had not, it hadn't occurred to me that I, I could study creative writing. I don't know why. I should have, but, um, but I, so I got out of college and almost immediately I was, I was writing creatively outside of my office hours. You know, I got a job in public relations and was, I remember I belonged to a a group at the public library actually in Columbia, South Carolina, where writers would get together in one of the community rooms and share each other's work. And it was me and a bunch of retirees. And, um, <laughs> you know, and I, that was what I did in my twenties, that kind of thing. And, um, when I started to get serious about this project, I felt like I wanted a little bit more structure. I had been starting to explore MFA programs. Um, but I was pretty limited by geography. I mean, my husband's a professor, I've got children, you know, I was working, like we're, we're pretty nailed down. And so I, um, I contacted the local MFA program at Virginia Commonwealth University, I live in Richmond, and just asked, you know, hey, is there any way you would let me as a continuing student take the novel writing workshop at, at VCU? Um, and you know, I just had a funny discussion with Tom DeHaven, who's the faculty member who started that novel writing workshop. He's an amazing writer. And um, he started it 25 years ago and has been running it until very recently. And uh, he was laughing about, you know, when he, when that email had gotten forward to him, forwarded to him about this brazen community member who wanted to take the novel writing workshop. And uh, he said he was prepared to turn me down, you know, but, uh, but I told them that I was interested in writing a novel set in New Jersey in the 1930s. And Tom DeHaven happens to write novels set in New Jersey in the 1930s. So he was, he, that convinced him that I was going to be okay. Um, but anyway, so I, so I took the novel writing workshop and it was a year long workshop. 
And I was just running to it after my job every, you know, once a week. And it was a wonderful way to start the novel because I had eight, there were eight of us in the workshop plus Tom and um, I could get instantaneous feedback, you know, which as a writer is just such a valuable gift. And when you're out in the world outside of an MFA program, you realize how hard it is to find. Um, but, you know, I, I say to people sometimes that I don't think it's, it's certainly not the only way to do it. Um, but what a workshop like that can do is it can stop you from doing something silly a lot sooner than you would have figured it out on your own. So um, the example I give is I, I start at the very first day when I showed up to workshop, I had this like 30 page prologue <laughs> and everyone in the workshop was able to immediately say like, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and the and the 30 pages actually was from Florence's perspective and it was all this great stuff about Florence and I really wanted to get to know Florence and it was like of course it's as soon as someone said well you just need to weave those stories in and people need to be able to remember her and I'm like right. oh right yeah you know so okay. that's the type of thing I, I would have come to but it would have taken me a lot longer so okay. um, I'm very grateful for that experience and when I finished the workshop in the course of two semesters I left with about 150 pages of the book um, and, and a great lead on an agent because Tom had, had set me up with his uh, good friend. And anyway, so it was, it was a lovely process to go through. And then I also, by the time I finished the class, I, I had applied to the MFA program officially. So I, it was all good. It worked out in a billion different ways. Okay. That, well, you, you went about it very creatively and yes. made it fit into your lifestyle, which was fabulous because um, first novels are not easy to come to or to get published. So it's, it, thank you for sharing that little bit of background on that, um, which leads me to the question that you just started talking about is the style of this book is very particular in that it is shifting chapter to chapter with a different viewpoint with a different narrator. And it's very nice because you don't make it difficult for anybody to know who's speaking. The chapter is the title of the person whose viewpoint we are going to be in. So there's there's a, a Gussie, a Esther, a Fanny, a Joseph, Stuart, and all, the, all those other seven people get their different chapters. So when you decided to do it that way, um, did you have a certain reason for doing it like that? And had you considered writing it in another viewpoint, just like just either one person doing it as an I, like say Esther could have told the whole story, or perhaps Gussie as the child, or some omniscient third person, third person, you know, viewpoint kind of looking at it all and the fact that you took Florence her narrative out of it how did you come about to those decisions um you know it's really funny sometimes I think you're right with the first novel it's like no one knows what they're doing and so some things you just kind of stumble into via blind luck and you're just glad it worked out the way it did the seven points of view I probably should have spent more time considering it but I just didn't you know I I had a conversation, um, I was at a writing conference before I started the book. Um, I had gone to Breadloaf and um, Ann Hood was my teacher that week. And she, I had asked her about it. I, that, that was kind of what I was intent on. You know, I hadn't written a word, I hadn't even researched it. But I said, I'm thinking, I have this idea and I'm thinking about writing a novel set in Atlantic City. With this, you know, I gave her the background of the story. And I said, can I, can I write it from seven points of view? Is that crazy? <laughs> And, um, and Anne Hood was a great person to talk to because she's just a very fun person and was like, oh yeah, you can do whatever you want. Like, in, no, she wasn't gonna like outline a whole bunch of rules about writing or, you know, she just said, yeah, you, you can do it. So, um, so I had that kind of be in my bonnet that like, okay, well, Anne Hood tells me I can do this. Um, and then when I started the workshop, um, I was already pretty at that point committed to my, you know, I had planned these kind of seven characters. I, I had an idea of who they were. Um, and I started to write, I wrote Gussie first. She was pretty easy for me. I loved writing Gussie. Um, and by the time I rotated over to Esther, who came next, she was good to write too. You know, like I, I fell mm -hmm. right into her. And so I, I quickly felt like, oh yeah, I, I've got the right, 
the right system here in place. Um, the thing that did give me pause was whether I um, should somehow insert Florence in um, and, you know, give her some sort of life beyond her life. Um, but I was leery of bringing her back and making her seem kind of almost ghost-like or, you know, I didn't want there to be a supernatural element to the book. Um, and so there were lots of reasons to not, to not bring her back. Um, and the, the seven points of view, one of the reasons that I think it really worked for me um, is that it was a way to examine grief. I mean, the book is about grief. Um, and it was a way to examine grief without bogging the reader down in so much sadness that they just couldn't see their way through it. Um, I think if I had told the story from only Esther's point of view, I mean, it would have been a real downer. <laughs> yeah, so I Esther, agree. Esther was really living it, you know, and um, as any mother who had lost a child would be. And, um, and I think that one of the things that I learned, I lost my father about 10 years ago and I come from a big family. I'm the eldest of four children. And I, in the process of losing him and, and all of us kind of mourning his loss, one of the things that I felt like I walked away from that experience understanding better was that everyone grieves differently and we all grieve in our own time. And, um, you know, one day when I'm devastated is a day when my sister's doing okay, getting out of bed. And so I'm not going to call her and ruin her day, you know, and, and vice versa. So, so I, I think that that helped me, um, as I started to think through, well, how am I going to write a, a book about grief, um, without making it so heavy that you can't get mm -hmm. through it. And, um, using the seven points of view was extremely helpful for me in that way, because, you know, when someone's having a bad day, someone else is okay. And, and certain characters are not as close with her anyway, so they're not mourning her in exactly the same way. So, so that became very helpful. And then the other part about the seven points of view is that when you're writing a book about secret keeping and the book for me was very much about secret <laughs> keeping and, and particularly secret keeping for other people's benefit, when, when you're doing that and you're rotating, when you get to the point where you might give away a secret, you can move on <laughs> to, the, to the next character. So it's a nice way to kind of keep all your balls of tension in the air. Right. It absolutely keeps the story moving. And I, I thought the seven points of view worked beautifully. Um, and I think that it'll work for, for readers as well. Um, and it's funny, I, I don't think you needed Florence to have her own voice. I think you, I, I ma I think you made the right choice. Yeah, I never questioned yeah, it after, yeah, yeah. after I kind of got through the first maybe rotation with everyone, mm -hmm. I didn't question it anymore. Um, I, Cause I really did feel like she comes alive through people's memories. Right. And, and I also think that that's very reminiscent of life. You know, I mm -hmm. don't believe that my father is gone. Like he's not gone until my family stops remembering him. And right. Um, so, so I think that that was a nice way to have her continue on in the story. Oh, absolutely. And that first chapter where she still is there for those few pages where she's live on the page, she is a force of nature and very vibrant. So we get a punch from, from her right away, which is great. Also the fact that Gussie with your rotating, um, when Gussie comes in, since she's just a little girl of seven years old, she's full of life. And I think that real that really is the balance. I think you did a really nice job of rotating the authors, the the narrators within the story. So that that was really well done. So um, it is a little risky though to kill off your title character. Yes, it is. <laughs> in the in the first chapter. <laughs> so, um, do you have anything else to say about how to how you thought about maintaining attention through the story when everybody knows? The big thing has happened. Well, I mean, chapter. I always knew. I, yeah, I've gotten I've gotten some pushback from people where they say, "Well, it's real. It's a real bummer that she dies in the beginning." And it's like, "Well, that that was what the story was about." Sorry, you know, the the story is about what happens to this family after she dies, um, and and particularly, you know, what happens to this other sister who is who's left in the dark. So. Um, 
so th there was never any doubt that that was the story. I mean, you know, that, that was the story I was choosing to write. So she was either going to die in the very beginning of the book or she was going to die off the page before the book even started. But, mm -hmm. you know, she wasn't going to be with us for the book. That was never going to happen. Um, but I did feel strongly that I wanted to put her on the page um, at, in the beginning because I, I wanted people to fall in love with her um, as much as they could in a very short time because I did really believe that the, I wanted I wanted the reader to mourn her loss along yeah. with her family. Mm -hmm. um, and I felt like the reader would have such a better comprehension of what the family was going through if they too had had a chance to fall in love with her. Um, and so that is what really led me to, to put that the death in the first chapter as opposed to having it happen before the story began. Um, there was another part to your question and now I'm forgetting what it was. Well, it was about the Alija. It was kind of the tension, keeping the yeah, tension oh, and that's page it. turning. I have an answer for that too. Um, so of course, like we're not, you know, if you get to page 14, you know that she's died. So um, you're no longer waiting to see what happens to her. Um, but I will say that one thing that was extremely helpful was that I had this pregnancy. You know, a pregnancy is automatically a ticking time bomb because you know that that baby has to come out at some point. It can come out early, there can be something wrong, but eventually it has to come out. Um, so that became the, the timeline for the story. And, and I really played with like the length of time I had in the summer and how much time I could stretch out a pregnancy. Um, but the, the issue with a pregnancy being your um, ticking time bomb is that if what you're worried about is, is the woman delivering early, um, then there is more tension at the beginning than there is at the end because of course, <laughs> the longer she goes in her pregnancy, the safer the pregnancy becomes, right? I mean, something can still go wrong with delivery, but, but you at least know that if she miscarried, you know, not miscarried, if she went into an early labor, there's a good chance that the baby would be okay. So I also had to fight against that. Like there were a lot of kind of medical conditions or issues that I was kind of constantly thinking about in terms of, well, all right, how is this um, kind of helping my tension or hurting my tension? Um, but I was certainly conscious of the fact that I, I wanted to make sure people were continuing to turn pages. Okay. Yeah. And there's lots of other secrets that start being revealed through the other characters as well. So we right. get involved in the other lives and you got to know, well, what's going to happen with that character and what's going to happen with that right. character. And that was always my goal was I, I felt like the, the story that had been in my family while it was moving to me and, and while I thought that it was the premise of a good novel, I knew that it couldn't be the whole story. Um, and so as I was imagining these characters, I was really thinking about how I could build in these other secrets that, um, that kind of reinforced the, the overarching one. Okay. In fact, one of the things you did with the change and not keeping it in a memoir was you changed the year when these things actually happened, correct? Mm -hmm. So could you address, it's a very, short little time frame difference, but I think the real events were 1929. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and this, couple... this book is 1934. So why change it just that little bit? What did that yeah. add for your plots and secret keeping perhaps? So it's funny. Initially, I, well, I had a few reasons. So Florence Lowenthal died, the, the real Florence died in 1929 in the summer of 1929. Um, and when I was starting to think about the book, I initially thought, well, I might go past the summer a little bit into the high holy days. I just wasn't exactly sure when I was cutting this off. Um, and um, immediately, of course, I thought about the stock market crash and I was like, whoa, I do not want to get into that. And um, I just didn't want the book to be about that and, you know, didn't want it to kind of enter into the um, ecosystem of the book. And I imagine it's kind of like how writers, when they look back on 2020, 
will will say, oh, I won't set my novel there. You know, I don't I don't want everyone wearing masks in my novel. <laughs> um, so so I was kind of interested in avoiding the fall of 1929. Um, then once I kind of developed the Anna storyline, Anna's an immigrant who comes over from Germany. She's a young woman about Florence's age. Um, and we're not quite sure how she connects with Joseph, the, the patriarch of family. Once I had her storyline in my head, um, I wanted to get into, um, I wanted to move the story forward far enough that the Third Reich had come to power um, and that there would be reason for Anna and her family to want to leave Germany. Um, you know, I wasn't interested in, you know, writing a book about World War II, but I, but I did want to um, kind of point to the tensions overseas and the mm -hmm. immigrant experience here in the U.S. That felt really important. And the layering, the ability to kind of layer Anna's story on top of Joseph's story of being an immigrant and Esther's story of her parents being immigrant, like that all worked really well for me. Um, so, so I wanted to move into the, the 30s. But what's really funny is when I started to research channel swimming, I realized I could only go but so far because once you start having like, U-boats in the channel and landmines and, you know, they started to kind of build an infrastructure to protect Britain from, you know, everything going on on the continent, it became unsafe to swim in the channel. So there was about a decade or so when nobody could swim the channel, it didn't matter how good an athlete you were. Um, so I, I did have to navigate the, the timing quite carefully to make, make sure that I could get that storyline I wanted, but, um, but also still have channel swimming be a part of it. Okay. So it sounds like you had to do a lot of fact checking research and things of that nature in order to not make any mistakes. <laughs> and then also to be sure that you added the flavor so that we feel like we're really being inserted into the times. So I know you had some photographs of your family and Atlantic City in this era and everything. What other kind of research and family members who could tell you stories, but what other kind of research did you need to do? Because one of the fun things I thought you brought in was about the early versions of incubators before the hospitals brought them in. There was a wonderful book. I don't know if you know it. Um, Leslie Perry wrote a, a book called Church of Marvels? Uh -huh. No, I, I haven't read it. Oh, oh, it's a wonderful book. Um, it's set a little earlier and it's about the incubators on Coney Island. That's one of the one of the parts of the story, not the whole thing, but about how those early versions of the incubators on Coney Island. And when I started reading your book, showing yeah. it on land, I went, whoa, this is the same thing. So could you share a little bit about research and, and putting that in there in particular, which I, which I just loved. I got a big smile on my face when I got to that yeah, part. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> um, well, I'll start with the incubators just because they're so fun and then we'll talk about research more generally. Um, the, the incubators are, are just a fascinating part of Atlantic City's history. Um, Dr. Cooney, they don't, they're not even sure he was a doctor, but he, he <laughs> came over from Europe. He had studied under a French obstetrician and uh, it, this would have been the turn of the century. And he um, had actually entered, on behalf of the French obstetrician, had entered an incubator in some sort of exhibition in Paris. So he was somewhat, you know, knowledgeable about incubators before he came to the U.S. And um, when he came, hospitals were nowhere close to being ready to purchase incubators. Um, you know, he, he believed in them, but um, at that time frame, people still really believed that if a baby was born premature, there was something wrong with it and, and that it wouldn't likely make it, you know, into adulthood, that there, there was some, something defective besides the prematurity. And so there just was no hope of him selling these incubators to hospitals. Um, and so what he did was he created these exhibitions. He called, the, called it the Infantorium. And he had one in Atlantic City and one at Coney Island. And he paid 25 cents and you could go in and it was a sideshow at the boardwalk and you could see babies in incubators. And at this time period, you had a lot of women who were still having babies at home. It was only kind of just becoming a thing to have your baby in the hospital. Um, it was maybe not even a good idea to be having your baby in the hospital, but you know, <laughs> we'll leave that for some other debate. Um, and 
so there were plenty of people who had nowhere to turn and said, well, if, if, you know, my baby's most certainly going to die at home. Um, but if I can give the baby to you and, and you can possibly do something, then by all means, put the baby in the sideshow. Um, and what's remarkable is that he had much better success than, you know, the hospitals did. There were many babies who lived. Um, for years, I don't know if they still do them, but there were reunions of the babies who had been in the incubators. So in Atlantic City, they would get together, you know, all of these kind of elderly people who had, um, you know, come, come, been saved by the incubators would, would get together. Um, and so it's just a really remarkable story about like American medical history. And, um, and of course the hospitals noticed that Dr. Cooney was saving babies. And so they bought incubators. Uh, um, so it's just a really interesting story. Um, and it's, it's one of those details that's hard as a writer when you're doing research on your book. Uh, it's hard not to put that kind of thing in. <laughs> and, and I frequently um, will say that like, I do really try, I, when I'm writing a book, and I mean, this is a piece of historical fiction, but I definitely am first and foremost just interested in telling a good story um, and writing compelling characters. And so I don't want to inundate the reader with historical details just to show kind of how much I've researched. Um, and so there were plenty of things I discovered that I just couldn't use or couldn't make work or gave only a tiny passing reference to. Um, an example of that would be the baby, the baby cages, um, which just get like two words, you know, in a description of the hotel. Um, but, but the, the incubators were something that I felt like, oh, this actually is, is something I can weave into the story and it makes sense. Mm -hmm. I'm sure baby. Um, so that was, that was really fun that, that I could do that. Uh, talking about research more generally, you know, Atlantic City was, a really fun place to write about. I wasn't that familiar with the city, um, despite the fact that my family was from there. I mean, they were from there a couple of generations ago, but my mother had never grown up there. And when her grandmothers died in the early eighties, that was really when everyone stopped visiting. So I never, um, you know, I never went there on school vacations or anything like that. Um, I've been a handful of times for, you know, work or, or, you know, we scattered my grandparents ashes there. I, we did their 50th wedding anniversary there, but I haven't been very often. And so when I was approaching writing the book, I really did approach Atlantic City like I would have approached any place I had never been before, you know, and so you've got old city directories and you've got um, lots of wonderful digital archives you can discover. And there are, of course, a lot of books that have been written. Um, but, but what was neat about Atlantic City was that because it was such a tourist town, I was able to um, rely on a lot of documents that I wouldn't have found for other cities, you know, postcards. I mean, all the hotels gave out free postcards because they hoped people would write home and say, you know, having a marvelous time, you should try it. Um, there were postcards of almost every single building in Atlantic City and often multiple postcards. So interior shots, out, exterior shots. Like I could get a really good sense of the buildings. Um, the piers, all of the piers were, you know, had tons of postcards. Then there were a lot of just campy souvenirs, you know, little trays and little purses and all kinds of things that had images and sayings. And, you know, there was just a lot that I could, that I could get my hands on. And my grandparents even gave me, um, before they died, guidebooks um, on Atlantic City from going back to the 1800s. I mean, because wow. Atlantic City was always a tourist town. Um, so there was just great, there was really great stuff to discover along the way, um, which made it really fun. Sounds great. Um, the historical research is always fun because it's, it adds such flavor to the story. And I've never been there, but I felt like you gave a real good touch. What I kept comparing it to Miami Beach, which is where my family used to go. And the, when you said all the little 
postcards and the hotels and all those kinds of things. So I think you gave a real good flavor of what Atlantic City was like at that time. And certainly, you know, the from a little girl's point of view versus, you know, an adult and the different generations and what it was like living there at the time, which brings us back to family. And I think if anything, this is a real family story because of Esther and Joseph as the matriarch and patriarch, and then the, the two sisters and the daughter. And well, we, we won't do spoiler alerts with the other people that are in there. There's the um, a cast of very, very interesting character that all have some kind of secret. So what I wanted to ask you to kind of lead us into the Q&A that we'll see what other people want to ask is this whole idea of secrets. Um, there are so many secrets that drive stories. I think secrets are a great plot driver to start with. But it seems like in real life, that's been a big thing that a lot of people have been writing about lately, um, true stories, memoirs of secrets. So Danny Shapiro wrote a book, Inheritance, which was wildly popular this last year, all about secrets that were revealed in her family. She has a very popular podcast called Family Secrets, Mm -hmm. where she interviews other people and their secrets and people call in. Um, Adrian Broger, came out with her book, Wild Game, about her mother and all the family secrets that she kept for so much of her life. Um, Do you see some or any parallels between those secrets that you wrote about and families and secrets today? And just the thought of, um, could something like this possibly be pulled off today? A secret of this dimension? And then I also wanted to know what other people in your family thought about you writing about their story if anybody was like no no even though you're fictionalizing it I wish you wouldn't do that or was your family all pretty much ready to say it's time for the for public viewing of of this not that it's embarrassing or anything but just that this was a family story and is this the time somehow where all these stories are coming out yeah um so regarding the family secret part. Um, I think that, I think that uh, it's been very interesting to, you know, the the books that you mentioned, I'm familiar with all of them. And I think that we, um, we do live in a much more confessional age. You know, we, we don't hold things as close to the chest. Um, so when you ask, you know, well, do I think that this story could have happened today? I mean, even if you just look at social media alone, it couldn't, it couldn't have happened because no one could keep a secret like this. Um, but even if you took social me- even if you took social media out of the mix, um, and you believed that it was possible to hide a death, um, I'm not sure that we have the like fortitude um, emotionally as a human race to 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 keep a secret like this these days. Um, you know, the, this was a real, I think, generational shift. I mean, I saw it with the story. Um, Florence's mother, after, you know, the summer was over and Fanny had had a healthy baby, um, she never she never spoke her daughter's name again. I mean, just never, never spoke her daughter's name. It was too painful. No one, no one could say, no one could say it. Um, and when you... And even in the subsequent generation, like Fanny never talked about her sister to um, my grandmother and to, you know, like it, it just it was not brought up. Um, it was deemed too tragic and too painful and it was not discussed. My grandmother obviously spoke of it enough that my mother knew about the story. But it was in my mother's generation that the story began to be retold. like more frequently. Um, And then of course, by my generation, I mean, I was connected to it because it was a family story, but I was also interested in it because it was just an amazing story. You know, the the family connection had been kind of severed in in some way. Um, So I did consider whether I could write this book in a different time period, you know, as I, I wasn't 100% convinced it had to be that time period initially, but I quickly did realize that I would lose something pulling it out of that era, that that, that era was um, key to not, not just, well, 
you know, I, I think I was not just interested in whether I could physically make these people keep a secret, but whether um, it was in keeping with their character. And, and it felt like in the 30s and the 20s, it was in keeping with enough people's character. Um, so that, that kind of addresses that part of your question. I will say that the legacy of that secret keeping um, did travel through the generations in different forms. So like while my family um, today is maybe not capable of keeping a death from each mm -hmm. other, uh, we do certainly still work hard at keeping lots of other secrets from each mm -hmm. other. And, and partly um, that is born out of the fact that for so many years, we put Esther's decision on a pedestal and said, like, if you love someone, this is what you do. Um, so so I, I do think that it has lingered through the generations, but I, I don't think it could be kind of played out in the same way in this generation. Okay. I appreciate that. And you had, a, you have other secrets too. I mean, Joseph, he has a secret at one point, Isaac has a secret. So there's other kinds of secrets besides your big one as well. And I think all of them are judged secretive a little differently. So you yeah. dealt with, I think the nuance of secrets. Yeah. Yeah. And my, my family has been very supportive. I mean, in answer okay. to that question, um, you know, it, this was, of course, hardest on my mother and her siblings, you know, not, not only did they know my grandmother, but they knew their grandparents who would have been Fanny and Isaac in the book. Um, and so uh, my mom, when I gave her the manuscript, I did have to kind of say, like, as I was handing it to her, like, mom, it, it's fiction. Like, I want you to <laughs> as you're reading this, it's fiction. I desperately wanted her to read it. And I, you know, I, I wanted her, I wanted her approval, but I also wanted her to just like help me if there were things I'd gotten wrong or, you know, uh, and she was a great editor um, for, for the book. Um, so it was wonderful to have her on board, but she said it took her about two thirds of the way book, through the book to, to forget that these characters were not her family, you know, to, to kind of think of them as the characters that I had created. That's great. That sounds like you had support from all angles and that, that's really nice. So um, again, congratulations on this wonderful book. I think Beth has opened up the chat box. So hopefully some people are writing their questions in there. Um, so please take your time now to do that. And also I'm gonna hold the book up once more, everybody. <laughs> Go back to your little note about the book bin, buy it, read it. Um, I don't like when people call, things beach books, but this is because this is set on the beach. So I'm going to say this is one you could read inside, outside, at the beach, wherever. And if you're on the beach reading it, just think about Florence and her family. And I hope you're a good swimmer. So thank you, Rachel. This has been lovely. Um, really, you've done a terrific job as far as I'm concerned. Thank you, Beth and the Highland Park Library for hosting. And Beth, take it away. Judy and Rachel, thank you guys. It was such an interesting and informative and entertaining conversation. So thank you both. Um, my colleague Juan has put up links, um, first of all, to Rachel's website to learn more. There's a link to the website and there's also a link to the bookstore, the book bin. So um, those who would like to purchase a signed copy can click on the link. And um, as we mentioned, you can have the book delivered to the library, it can be shipped to your home, or you can pick it up from the bookstore in Northbrook. And they do a great job with um, contact-free pickups. So um, I don't see any questions at the moment, but it looks, we'll, um, oh, okay, questions are pouring in. So I'm gonna start with um, Shelley. How do you manage to find time to write with three children at home, especially if they're in school virtually now? Ah, uh, Shelly, you have hit the nail on the head. <laughs> um, I don't know. How am I doing this right now? Um, virtual school starts Tuesday. <laughs> um, here's how I did it while I was writing Florence Adler. I'll tell you that. Um, I was working full time and I was in grad school and I had three kids and I realized the only time I was going to do it was if I woke up really early. So I would write at, um, I would set my alarm for 430 in the morning. I did that seven days a week for two years. And like, 
I didn't even take days off for vacations. Like I did it every day. Um, and then sometimes on the weekend, I would also sneak away like on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon for a couple of hours if I could, if I could manage it. Um, I also snuck away, I, I'm like adding up all the hours. Uh, when my kids went to Sunday school, so we're Jewish and they, they go to Sunday school, but of course we don't have to go anywhere because it's Sunday. So, uh, so I would go to the library during that window of time too and, and work. So I stole it anywhere I could get it. I would write in cars. I would write at swim practice. I would write anywhere, you know, that I could get some time, but I, but I did definitely um, always carve out that two and a half hours in the morning. And that's the only way that I could have done this. Um, and then I sold the book and I finished my MFA and I quit my full-time job and I was so excited to become a full-time writer. And then, um, of course we find ourselves in a global pandemic and my children haven't left my house since March. <laughs> so I don't know what I'm going to write. So actually, I'm back to doing exactly what I was doing before. Um, and I'm not waking up at 4.30. I'm waking up at 5. Um, but since my children are sleeping in later, I'm, I'm able to kind of carve out a good chunk of time from like 5 to... Sometimes they sleep till like 9. Um, but I guess that stops next week when they have to be <laughs> on Zoom by 9. So we'll, we'll see. But yeah, it's still, it's still mornings for, for now. And then... I'm hoping that I can, I'm hoping if everyone's really good at virtual school, mommy can also be doing some virtual education slash writing, but we'll see. Good luck with that. Yeah, um, <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's see. Karen is asking, why didn't Fanny ever blame her husband for the first miscarriage? I assume it was the result of the bumper cars, she's saying. Are, are we giving away spoilers here? Are we okay with um, Do you want to... We can hold on to that one, perhaps. Maybe. Um, let, me th let me think if I can answer it in a way that's. I mean, I I'll, I'll say something kind of general about Fanny, and then if she wants to hang out a few minutes after or whatever, I'll feel free to keep chatting. Um, you know, I as I envisioned Fanny's character, um, I just envisioned a woman who could have been every bit as passionate about something as as Florence was about um, swimming. But, you know, she just, um, she'd married young, she'd married the wrong person. Um, and so here we were many years later where she felt so kind of trapped by this old decision, you know, this decision that she couldn't undo. Um, she's got her daughter, Gussie. Um, she's, you know, lost a baby, she's pregnant again. She's really, she's got a lot going on. Um, but she's also just kind of deeply unhappy in a way that she can't even name completely. Um, and so that was something I thought about as I thought about her relationship to Isaac. I, you know, I guess I, I will just say that. Um, and, and I also don't think that, I mean, one thing kind of generally to say about the, the point of view shifts is that um, because I shifted point of view, um, I didn't necessarily, um, you didn't necessarily get every, every feeling she'd ever had about him. Um, you kind of dipped in to, to different, different points of view, you know, different times when she was thinking about him. Um, and then, you know, regarding the bumper cars, I also, I had to be careful with the, let's see, okay, I, I'm maybe going to go too far. Oh, hold on. Okay. Maybe we'll put a pin in that and then we'll wait and I'll, if we do a little spoiler part at the end and then all the people who have read the book can maybe jump off the call. Okay. Sounds good. And just, um, if we come up to others, just let us know. Um, okay. Nancy is asking, why did you feel compelled to make Isaac such a despicable character? I know you said in your afterward that the real Isaac wasn't like this. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I mean, one thing is just that every story needs a um, antagonist. You know, it's it, it, fiction doesn't work as well when there isn't one. Um, my mother would have much preferred every character in this book to be wonderful. <laughs> um, that would have really helped her sleep at night. Um, 
so, but I just, I just couldn't get away with that. Um, and as I started to think about uh, Fanny, I, I started with all of the women kind of that, that was the, that was where I began planning. You know, I, I knew that in order to mirror my family story, um, I needed, you know, I needed those women. I needed um, Gussie at the beach. I needed Fanny in the hospital bed. I needed Florence swimming the English Channel. And I needed Esther, you know, spearheading the secret keeping. Um, and then I built the men off of the women. Um, and so, for instance, in the real story, Joseph isn't even alive um, when Florence dies. I mean, you know, in the family, in my family, he had died about a year and a half before she died. Um, it's quite suddenly. So, so there were many changes I made to the structure of the family in order to um, just kind of work with the story. Um, Florence was also one of six children, and I, I didn't, I just didn't want to deal with that many siblings. I could, couldn't handle it. No. Um, so, the decision. Um, as I started to think about Fanny in the hospital room, in the hospital bed, she was a challenging character to write because she um, she didn't know the secret, right? So everyone else is walking around with the secret in their head and they're making decisions based on it and they, they have agency over their own lives. And she's stuck in a bed, um, has no agency over her own life and, and can't even move. And that's one thing as, as writers, we're always trained to do is um, keep our characters moving. You know, you don't want a character who just sits in a chair and looks out the window. Um, so she was very challenging for me. And I started to kind of imagine this whole world for her um, and her own secrets and, you know, all of this. And um, I quickly kind of realized, well, okay, she needs a concern because her concern cannot be, um, you know, well, gosh, I, I hope I don't find out the secret. <laughs> so, um, so giving her Isaac gave her plenty to worry about. Um, that was my, that was my feeling. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, Lois says, uh, Joseph in the beach chair is a memorable scene. Uh, yeah. A nice comment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And Carol says, FYI, there was a recent news item about a woman who swam 24 hours in Lake Michigan, which is in our backyard, because she couldn't swim the channel this year due to COVID-19. It caught my attention because it I just read and enjoyed your book. That's a wonderful story. I had not heard that. And um, yeah, I, I have been thinking a lot about channel swimmers this summer and thinking like, what are they doing? Are they not doing it? Are they, you know, because you train so hard. Um, and I was so fascinated the more I read about the training and um, I read a lot about Trudy Etterly who had swum the English channel, um, you know, become the first woman to swim the English channel. Um, and it's such an incredible feat and, and requires so much in terms of training and preparation um, that I can't imagine. I mean, I think the same thing about the Olympians um, this year, you know, and just how heartbreaking it must be to be at the top of your game and then have to kind of stand still. Um, and of course, that was exactly what Fanny wanted Florence to do. Um, oh, let's see, we are winding down. Um, I know that Judy mentioned the book cover. Can you chat about that for a minute? Did you have any input? Was that a surprise to you? Um, was it your suggestion, you know, or was it the publishing house that they came back to you with that? The book cover is really fun. Um, so it was, um, it, it's actually illustrated The the painting that you see is, um, done by a woman named Lisa Golightly. Um, I think she's based in Portland, Oregon, and she was a woman that I have followed on Instagram for years. Oh. She does these beautiful paintings of um, people on beaches, and they're usually very, um, they almost have like a photographic quality to them. If you, if you look on her website or her Instagram, you'll see what I mean. They just almost, it looks like she's painting your old family photos that you've just like pulled out of a drawer. Oh, can you um, say her name again? Lisa Golightly. 
And I think her Instagram handle might be like Lisa Go Lightly Art or something like that. But anyway, I've loved her for a long time. And, <laughs> um, and I wouldn't say the book is even completely reminiscent of her style. So like, go check her out because, you know, whether you like the book or don't like the like book, you may love, you know, her. Um, but she, um, I sent a link to her Instagram to my agent way back we'd sold the book, but like, it was barely a thing, you know, like we hadn't even started editing the book or anything. And I sent it to my agent and I was like, don't you think her stuff would just be amazing for the cover of the book? And he was like, Rachel, that's very nice. But remember authors don't get any decision, <laughs> like any right. control of their book and stop even thinking about your book cover. And I said, okay, okay. Yeah, I, of course. I'm, I'm not even thinking about it. I mean, and I had sent it, it to him like as an Instagram link. It wasn't like a very official, whatever. So that was like, I don't know, February or something. And then in August, I got an email from my editor that was like, hey, we think we're gonna go with Lisa Go Lightly for your cover. Um, and my jaw just dropped. I mean, it was like my dream come true. And um, so I think that Chad had put a little bug in their ear and said like, Hey, what about this? And it just so happened. I don't think they would have done it for me as a favor in by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but I do think that they saw it and thought the same thing I did, which is that, oh, wow, this is like capturing there. There's something about her images that actually just capture what you imagine Atlantic city would have felt like. Mm -hmm. So. Anyway. Oh, thank, yeah, thanks for sharing that. That was so fun. So I think it's after eight o'clock. Um, we have one more question and um, and then I don't know if anyone wants to hang on for um, your spoiler alerts or we can just say yeah. goodnight. If, if, um, if anyone wants to stay at the end, I'm happy to answer like those burning questions. That just okay, I'm just going to ask. Um, Andrea wants to know if you were concerned by hiding Florence's death from her parents um, about not fulfilling Jewish morning rituals? Um, was I concerned? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I knew that that was a problem <laughs> for sure. <laughs> um, I mean, that was one of the things that they had to, um, that, that's one of the things they were sacrificing in order to, to do this was, um, you know, that they were giving up on, on some of their traditions that were important to them and, and particularly important to Joseph. Um, so that very much became one of the like pieces of tension of the book, um, was that, that these were having to be, um, sidelined. So for sure. Um, thank you so much. That's all our questions. So, um, I don't think we, um, gave away any spoilers, right? So, um, okay. We are good. And, um, it was really a pleasure having you, um, Join our Meet the Author series. Thank you so much, Judy. Thank you, Allie. Thank thanks you. for being our bookseller. And um, again, links to Rachel's website and to the Book Bin's website are in your chat box. Um, and that wraps up our Meet the Author event. And thank you so much, Rachel and Judy. Good night. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for having me. Great. Good night, guys.